I'm uh, very pleased to uh, introduce uh, Leah van der Hoek from uh, the University of Amsterdam, who is a vir virologist uh, and who was uh, uh, identified uh, one of the seasonal coronaviruses, NL63. Uh, and um, she's going to uh, talk to us about uh, reinfections with seasonal coronaviruses uh, and uh, impl implications for SARS-CoV-2. And uh, uh, Leo will share her screen, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, okay, first of all, thanks for inviting me. It's a it's a pleasure and it's um, uh, an honor also. Um, the, the reason why I was invited is a, is a recent commentary in uh, MED, a new journal, uh, that I wrote about reinfection. And the, re the reason for writing that was a recent study that was published in Nature Medicine. I will tell about that study in this presentation. Um, but um, uh, to, to, to just go back, NL63 was mentioned and there it all started for me. Uh, actually, I'm not really a coronavirologist. I'm uh, somebody doing virus discovery. And in 2001, already almost, well, 10, 20 years ago, I started to develop a novel method to find new viruses. And in 2003, that method worked. It's called Fidisca. And uh, then I went to the Municipal Health Service of Amsterdam and they, uh, I presented my method. I have a method to find novel viruses. And they said, well, we have a culture which we cannot type. Uh, the cells look uh, horrible after uh, inoculation. Um, and that's shown on the right. So the infected cells, the, there you see rounding and you see detaching from the surface. This is control uninfected. Um, and um, uh, so there's clearly something replicating and uh, then they asked me to find out which virus it is. And it turned out to be a coronavirus, one which looks like the old ones, but is certainly a different species. Um, and I named that virus NL63. And this, this uh, isolate, Amsterdam 1, uh, is still the only isolate I think used, uh, is still at this moment the, the, the only used worldwide. It's available via uh, 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 this virus supply service. Uh, and I also share it with anybody who is interested to work uh, with it still. Um, uh, after I find found the virus, I, I must say I work on many different viruses, but uh, this NL63 being the first one novel virus I found, I, I really worked on for years and years full-time research, and I did a lot. Uh, so I looked at virus transcription, evolution, therapy options. I found a link with disease being uh, in young children is croup, the loud barking cough. I also determined what the burden of disease is. So 22 children uh, end up in hospital per year uh, of 100,000 up uh, on 100,000 children. Uh, found together with Stefan Pullman, the receptor being ACE2, the same receptor as uh, SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV are using. Um, determined the average age of first infection and the susceptibility to reinfection. And those two uh, studies and the ones that will be included in this presentation as well. Um, also, this is the only picture of NL63, and it's made by a group in, in London. Um, and uh, I, I like the picture of it. It's the only picture available of NL63. So back to SARS-CoV-2 and reinfections. Uh, what can we learn from the other coronaviruses that will uh, tell us something about what we can expect for SARS-CoV-2? Well, what we can expect, we're in the middle of it. We're in the middle of the period that we uh, see uh, some reinfections already occurring. Um, and translating uh, other coronavirus work, which I will show you is, is work from 60 years, uh, is mainly then done on the human coronaviruses giving the common cold, uh, which is uh, the alpha coronaviruses, NL63 and 229E, and the beta coronaviruses, OC43 and HKU1. And in the beta coronaviruses is also the SARS-CoV viruses, mers cov viruses, although they're in different branches. Um, these are called the seasonal human coronavirus or the non-highly pathogenic human coronaviruses or the endemic human coronaviruses. There are different names. I will probably uh, use, call them seasonal coronaviruses uh, during this talk. 
229E and OC43 were the ones which were found in the mid 1960s. So found very early then NL63, 2004 and HGU1 came one year after discovery of NL63. And many groups have tried to find more, uh, but didn't succeed. So this is probably the complete set of uh, human coronaviruses that are not the highly pathogenic ones. Those are the endemic, they, they are among us. They are part of our, our uh, um, uh, system. Uh, still, I want to mention one uh, publication by Terrell and Bainu in 1965, and they described the virus culture B814, and everything they uh, tell about this virus is characteristic for a coronavirus. So probably this 1965 publication was actually the very first corona, human coronavirus publication. But this isolate is lost for follow-up. So now we have 229E and OC43, the old ones, and NL63, HKU1, as isolate the new ones, but as viruses, they were among us for, for centuries. So these NL63 and HK1 are new ones. They just have been found in 2004 and in 2005. Um, they, are, uh, they, they may look a bit alike, uh, these two alpha coronaviruses, two beta coronavirus, but actually biologically, biologically they are very different. So NL63 is infecting ciliated epithelial cells <clears throat> that express ACE2 on the surface, so the same receptor as, as the SARS-CoV viruses, but 229E is infecting the non-ciliated epithelial cells um, in the lung and, um, and those that are expressing aminopeptidase N. So aminopeptidase N is the receptor. And for the beta coronavirus, it's even more different because they don't use a protein to enter their target cells. They use su sugars, so glycans. Um, and they infect the glycans, um, they, they infect the ciliated cells uh, in, the, um, uh, in the trachea, in the lungs. Uh, and they're very, um, the HK1 cannot be cultured so far, only when you use differentiated human uh, airway epithelia. Uh, but there's no cell line that allows propagation. Well, there is one isolate of OC43 that can be cultured in a cell line. <clears throat> and, uh, and the same is for 229E. There's an isolate that can be cultured in a cell line and also for NL63. Um, well, they, so they're not very alike, but of course they, uh, they do have alike that they're all respiratory viruses and they all cause common cold, which is a, a general characteristic and they cannot be, an infection cannot be distinguished. Um, that's more or less shown here. These are the cultures, uh, these are the uh, symptoms scored if you have, uh, if you infect volunteers. Uh, this was not still possible uh, in 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, and even in the 1990s, there were still volunteers being inoculated with 229E or OC43 cultures. And these are the symptoms that you get when you get infected by uh, OC43. This is day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and you get stuffiness of the nose, sneezing, um, mucus in the nose, uh, sore throat, and some cough. So typical common cold, this is OC43. This is not a, such a nice figure, but this is a table. This is the colds you get, the symptoms you get uh, in colds with 229E. Uh, you see handkerchief usage, which means it's probably a runny nose. Um, and uh, you have some headache, um, some sore throat, some cough. This is the same as, more or less the same as OC43. And also in the old papers, it's mentioned that um, uh, when they say, well, for 2 to 9E, we saw the same symptoms as an OC43 infection. Um, <clears throat> well, these volunteers that were infected and then these symptoms are shown, is this the symptoms you get when you get your very first infection? So were these... Um, infections in a virgin um, host, so somebody who has never seen the virus before. No, probably not. We investigated uh, at what age you get your first infections by these seasonal coronaviruses. And we did that by looking at newborns that had been followed for 20 months, uh, the first 20 months of life and uh, regularly collected um, or co and re regularly uh, blood was collected. And here you see, so here in the XX, here's the time of birth, and this is 20 months of follow-up. And here's the signal in ELISA. 
Uh, and then you see that here there's zero conversion for two to nine E. So this child uh, obtained an inf the, the virus in April, 2004, and then had antibodies. And then between um, June, 2004 and um, June, 2005 in this year, there was also an infection by NL63 shown with the raising of the antibodies. So with these antibodies, you can determine if somebody gets infected. And we did that in total with 25 children for all four coronaviruses. And then we saw this uh, occurring, it's summarized in this table. So here you have for NL63, at what age your you have seroconverted. So this child was uh, seroconverted in January 2006, and the age of the child was 21 months. Here's another child, 21 months, 17 months, 19 months, total 25 children and some were infected very early within two months of life. And then they had already had antibodies developed. Uh, this occurred less for 2 to 9E, only five infections by 2 to 9E in these 25 children, most infections by OC43, as shown here, and more or less in intermediate number of infections by HKU1. So these children, a lot of children get infected already at uh, uh, in the first years of life, first two years of life, get infected by these seasonal coronaviruses. Um, and then there's a study by a group in, in China uh, and uh, they looked consecutively. Uh, so they had all, had all kinds of sera of different age groups and then looked at how many of them are sera positive for the different viruses. And then you see that um, it, it, it takes a few years for 2 to 9e, but then at age four to six, it's the maximum that's reached for 2 to 9e and also for HQ1. Four to six years of age, then HQ1, then uh, the maximum is reached uh, of children that become seropositive. And for uh, NL63 and OC43, it's the same. So all children get their first infection during early childhood, the first years of life. So these symptoms that were scored um, in this uh, volunteer infection are actually the symptoms you can get when you have a reinfection. So it's not the first infection, it's a reinfection. And the same for this 2 to 9E infection. But then what's interested is in this uh, table is that of the 26 volunteers that were inoculated with uh, 2 to 9E, only 13 developed symptoms. So 50% had symptoms and 50% did not. So apparently there's protection, but protection against disease or protection uh, with getting infected. And um, <clears throat> uh, this was uh, noted already very early uh, that not all volunteers could get an infection. And already in 1967, this was uh, investigated. What are the determinants that um, uh, what are the variables that determine whether you can be reinfected or not be reinfected, whether you have uh, protection. And so this very early paper was uh, already in 1967, a paper by Bradburn. Um, and there's a beautiful paper in 1985 from Callow. Uh, also beautiful research paper. I will show them both. Uh, and this second paper is by Callow as the only sole author on the paper. And uh, this is from the study by Bradburn from 1967. And here you see a total of 26 volunteers that were infected by 2 to 9E. And uh, these 26 volunteers, they were, uh, separ they, they were divided in four groups based on their, the levels of their neutralization titer prior to, to uh, the inoculation with the virus. So you have some that were very low in neutralization titers uh, intermediate titers and high neutralization titers. And then they looked how many could get infected. And this is infected, excretion of the virus. And they measured excretion by the virus at that time, the only way they could by culturing the virus uh, after inoculation and how many developed colds, so symptoms. And I put these numbers in a new table. And here you see that if you have high neutralizing titers, then you have only one in four that can get infected, that have the virus. While if you have very low neutralizing titer, then the majority um, shows infection. So there's virus replicating 
um, in the nose, in the respiratory symptoms. Not all have symptoms. Um, that's on the next slide. If you uh, then take symptoms, then you see that um, in the group with the lowest neutralization titer, that there you see the highest number of symptoms. So those that get infected, uh, there's only, I'll go back, there's only one of them that does not get symptoms. Uh, <clears throat> while uh, if you go to the 10 to 40% neutralization titer, there was 75% that got infected, but only 37% have uh, symptoms. So these neutralizing antibodies, they protect from infection, uh, but if infected, they also can protect uh, from disease. Well, and I must say, this is not uh, solid, this is an association. This is the second paper by Callow. Uh, and this paper uh, looks at all kinds of different variables that could uh, lead to protection from being reinfected. So there are two groups, one affected, which means infected, and one uh, which did not become infected. And so the unaffected group it's called here. Um, and this paper by Kello, this is table three. This is the most important table, but it has, I think, in total four of these tables looking at all kinds of variables um, with uh, all kinds of different uh, things that have been compared with each other. Difficult to read, I must say. Uh, therefore, the conclusions from this table I took from the text. And this is what in the, what's in the text of the paper by Kello. Um, People that do not get infected or do not get symptoms, they have much more neutralizing antibodies, exactly the same as what Brad Byrne found. But she also did ELISA's and she showed that uh, if you look at the virus specific IgG, so the virus was coated on the ELISA plate, then you also see that the more IgG um, recognizing the virus, it is associated with being protected, but not so significant as the neutralizing antibodies were. And the same for IgA. Also, IgA is associated with being protected, either measured in serum or measured in saliva. Um, so IgA, IgG, and, neutral, uh, and especially the neutralizing ones, they provide protection. And that's summarized here on this first conclusion slide. So it's neutralizing antibodies, IgG, IgA. It's a, now it's an open door. Of course it's an open door, but it needs to be shown that these are factors that determine whether you're, you can become infected or you cannot become infected. And it's also good to know that we're now looking at antibodies after vaccination, and we can tell from these studies that they are probably very informative if you start looking at neutralizing antibodies or the IgG and IgAs. Then the second part, that is homologous and heterologous challenges. What happens if you give volunteers one virus and then a year later you give them another infection by the same virus or a different variant? Uh, so then it's a heterologous infection. What happens? Are you protected? Uh, uh, does this first infection provide protection against the other one? Uh, or is, is there no protection? Do you get infected again? Uh, a very important uh, knowledge also, of course, for, for this uh, time, in these times, and only two studies have looked at this, and that is again, Kello. Um, <clears throat> it's not the first, the single author paper, but it's a beautiful paper from 1990. Uh, and there's another, also I must say, a beautiful paper by, um, uh, by Sylvia Reed, um, and also sole author on this beautiful research paper. And these are the only two studies that can be used to extrapolate information, which we can use now. Um, before I um, show, these, uh, show the data from these two papers, I want to mention here that 229E challenge, re-challenge um, is, is, is quite an, uh, takes quite an effort because you need different isolates to do this, uh, to do the re-challenge. But these isolates have to be from a different times. Uh, different collection time. Um, so here I have um, um, a list of the different types that are used in these studies. So VR740 is the one that still can be bought at uh, ATCC, first isolated uh, in 1962. Then there's the LP strain, which was isolated in 1965. And then there are four which have been isolated in the mid-1970s. And here you see 
um, so you see six strains and um, they differ. No, these from the mid 1970s, they probably do not differ a lot. They might, might even be called simply homologous strains because 229E um, shows only genetic drift, which means that all variants from a certain time point are very alike. And only difference that's there is between the time points of collection and that's shown here. So these are, this is a representative of the 1960 strain. And then you see these are the 70s, 80s, 84, the 90s, 2000, 2004. So you see genetic drift away from an ancestor and there's only at a certain moment, there's only one type circulating. This is different from um, I must say, this is different from NL63. Here you see in 2004, it was this type circulating and also this type. So for NL63, there are two types co-circulating. There is not, the difference is not genetic drift. Same for HKU1, same for OC43. There, there's two types. So only, only for 2 to 9E, uh, there's one type with genetic drift. So these, uh, these challenges, these homologous and heterologous challenges, um, have to be from isolates of different time points. Uh, so here they are. <clears throat> and I want to start with this one. This is the homologous um, challenge of 229E uh, um, described by Reed. And here the strain used is the TO strain, which is one from the mid 1970s. And um, if then there's a reach, so there's first an infection by TO. Then they take the persons that really showed symptoms and had a, a virus infection, and uh, those were six, and those six were re reinfected by the TO isolate 12 months later, and then you see that none of them got infected. So there was protection against infection when you have a homologous uh, re-challenge with the virus. But th there's another study that used LP strain, so LP strain is from the mid-1960s, um, and then homologous challenge, and then there was uh, there were nine persons that had a, uh, an infection with symptoms in one year, and when they were re-challenged, six of them had virus production in the nose. Um, so there was no protection from infection, but none of them had symptoms. So there was protection from symptoms. So you get protection from symptoms or protection from infection when you're infected by exactly the same variant. Well, this is also the case when you have a heterologous challenge. That's not the case. This is uh, the first infection was symptom with symptoms by I, one of these strains. So it could be the 1960 strain or the 1970 strains. And then the re-challenge was done by, by either if it was 70s, it was the 60s to do the challenge and, and the other way around. Uh, if the 60s was one of the first, um, and then they saw there was no protection. Five out of eight could be infected, which is the, 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 the close to the normal 50% um, chance of becoming reinfected. Uh, there was also one isolate, which is called PA, uh, and uh, Sylvia Reed described that this is a very strange isolate because it did not replicate as expected for a 229E strain, um, for a 229E isolate. Um, and, um, and she described uh, the symptoms, the, not the symptoms, the characteristics of this culture. And if you now look at it in hindsight with the knowledge we have of NL63, this was probably the very first isolate from the 1970s. Uh, of, uh, of NL63, this PA, PA isolate. So it was a heterologous challenge, but even with different species and uh, also as expected, uh, no protection. Um, so that was the fourth one. Conclusions, uh, reinfections occur more frequently and there's less protection when the second virus is genetically distant. Again, you will probably say, well, this is again an open door, but it needs to be shown. You need to show that these things, these basic uh, um, ex expectations uh, occur for coronaviruses. Well, everything I showed so far on this 2 to 9 e and OC43 was not a natural situation. This was all from cultured virus where volunteers were inoculated through the nose with kilos of virus. Um, uh, and uh, this may not be the natural situation with droplets and you have to acquire it uh, uh, through the natural way. 
So can it be that this is uh, in real life not occurring, these reinfections uh, and things like that? So, so we um, investigated what occurs in, in, in real life. And we did it again as with these children, we looked at antibody levels to see if somebody got infected. And we now did it with adults. Uh, adults that had been followed for decades, so over 20 years, some followed even for 30 years, and, uh, and blood was collected regularly, and this is in the Amsterdam cohort studies of HIV infection and AIDS. And this cohort study has two arms, one arm with HIV positive persons and one arm with HIV negative persons. Um, and they, these HIV negative persons are followed to see if they might seroconvert for HIV, so become seropositive. Uh, but some, for, for some, actually for many, this did not occur. So they have been HIV negative from beginning till the end. And the end is uh, now they're still in follow up, which means we have blood samples of these persons um, for 30, 35 years. I must say there has been a gap, an annoying gap between 1997 and 2003, when we did not follow these, um, these volunteers, but luckily they returned again in 2003. And since then we have uh, again, these regular collected blood samples. <clears throat> we looked at infection. Again, uh, like we did with the children with a rise in antibodies, because a rise in antibodies is an indication that the body has seen the virus again and reacted to the infection. And we used an uh, ELISA that's very specific for, the, for each of the four viruses, the C-terminal part of the M protein, uh, and um, which, is, uh, which we confirmed is specific for each virus um, if we take the highest reaction. I will show that uh, in a minute. Um, this may, may look complicated. I think it will become clear when I show examples. Um, and this is the first <coughs> example. Um, here you see uh, on the x-ax, you see the fo follow-up. So this person was followed until 2011, then lost to follow-up, started in 1985. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and here you see in red, uh, here you see in 1986, probably the person uh, the rise in antibodies to NL63. So there was in this previous period, there was an infection by NL63. The same one year later, <coughs> an NL63 infection. And here another NL63. In between, there was a 2 to 9E infection. And this is what I meant with we always take the highest. There was a bit of rise also for NL63, but NL63 and 2 to 9E are in the same uh, genus. And there is a little bit of cross reactivity in these ELISAs. So we take the highest within a genus, we take the highest signal. Um, so this is a 2 to 9E infection. And also this is a 2 to 9E infection. Uh, there were no OC43 infections in this in individual one, HK1. And um, we needed to know for sure that these fluctuations in the antibody titers are not fluctuations which you will have when uh, every time that you're stressed or whatever external reason, but uh, reasons which are not by the virus. And that's shown here. Here's our control. These volunteers were all vaccinated for measles. Um, and, uh, and you see, and they were not infected by measles in the, in the follow-up period. And you see that there's this nice flat line of measles um, antibodies. So if you're not infected, then there's no fluctuation of antibodies only when you have an infection. And we also confirmed this rise and the amount of rise, we also confirmed it with PCR, um, uh, PCR known positives and then uh, serum collected five weeks after this infection to, to know that it's really uh, rising with this antigen in ELISA. So this person had some NL63 infections, two to the 9E infection. Here's a person with one, two, three, four NL63, uh, three, two to 9E infections, one OC43 infection, and some three HKU1 infections in time. And this person was, this is one of those person followed, um, followed from 1985 until uh, 2020, still in follow-up actually. Uh, here's another one. Some NL63, 2-9E infections, several OC43 infections. Um, here's another one. Um, well, 
it's very clear. You, you can see with the peaks in antibodies when a person got infected. And we did in total 10 of these uh, subjects. And this is then the summary table. So here are the 10 individuals, the 10 subjects of the Amsterdam cohort studies. This is the amount of months with continuous follow-up. And there you see uh, 2,400, more than 2,400 months. So more than 200 years of continuous follow-up of these persons. And here is then the total 101 coronavirus infections, this specific rise in antibodies um, during these follow-up. So a lot of coronavirus infections most by 229E and also quite a lot with OC43, uh, NL63 and the least only eight with HKU1. <clears throat> um, and, but I must say this is not because HKU1 uh, occurs less often, probably our ELISA is not very specific for HKU1. So it, it has a, uh, not specific, it's, it's very low sensitivity for HKU1. I think we missed some HKU1 infections. Um, and then the reinfection. So among this, these 101, there were 50 infections where we had continuous follow-up between the two infections. So then we could determine how much time it takes uh, for one infection um, until the next moment that you have an infection, how long does it last? Um, and uh, what we saw is that the first reinfections already occur. It's only three, it's a few, but they did occur at six months. So six months later, there are a few where you already see that there's a new infection, one with OC43 and two times for 2 to 9E, shown here in blue, in green, OC43, this NL63, and this is the total in purple HKU1. So in six months, there were a few, and if you look at 12 months, it is more. And then it is more or less stable, but this shows on that at 12 months, it can occur frequently. Meaning that at this moment, probably um, your um, protection is waning. And that's what we um, translate from this. <clears throat> um, these natural reinfections, um, the, the symptoms that were previously scored by um, uh, these 2 to 9 e and, and OC43 papers were all from experimental infections, as mentioned, with kilos of virus. Could it be that the symptoms that were scored are only scored when you infect with these uh, cultured viruses? Uh, no, we see in this natural situation, we also see that infection is associated with symptoms. These uh, volunteers are followed in a questionnaire every time they, uh, they came to the municipal health service to donate blood. They were asked what kind of symptoms they had in the period prior to blood collection. Uh, did they have fever? Did they have uh, um, a notable uh, a headache, sore throat, cough? All kinds of influenza-like illnesses were scored. And here you see it's not a massive association, but there is an association between uh, any of the coronavirus uh, infections and uh, any of the symptoms. <clears throat> um, so indeed, there was, an, uh, um, there was an association with symptoms in this natural situation. And so reinfections uh, do, can, uh, can occur with, uh, with symptoms. Um, um, then the final part is the, uh, the animal field. There are many, many coronaviruses that infect animals. They can infect um, uh, chicken. Um, so that's uh, uh, in the infectious uh, bronchitis virus uh, uh, infecting chicken. There is uh, it's coronavirus infecting cattle, uh, mice, um, uh, um, pigs and cats and dogs. And uh, so you would expect after 60 years that they have been uh, identified, I think IBV was even identified already in the 1940s. Uh, how much time do we know on susceptibility of becoming reinfected? Well, actually uh, almost nothing because these viruses are infecting chicken, pigs, cattle, and these, these animals, they do not get old. Um, and they're also not uh, important enough for us humans to, to measure them really in time to see if they get reinfections. Um, so they're either dead because they're slaughtered already or they were not studied, except for, for one uh, study and that was in cats. 
in cats. Uh, apparently cats are important enough for veterinarians or perhaps because the research group was interested in them. But there's one study on cats and reinfection. It's a beautiful study by Eddie et al. In, uh, published in, uh, uh, in 2000. Um, and uh, they studied a, a one house, it's one household with 26 cats and they uh, collected blood every half year or every year of these cats. And then they looked for antibodies directed to feline coronavirus. <clears throat> and feline coronavirus is an uh, alpha coronavirus. So it's in the same, same group as uh, 229E and NL63. Uh, it's a mild it's a mild virus. Uh, cats hardly get sick. Uh, perhaps it can be uh, compared to common cold for us. Uh, so so not really seriously ill, unless it mutates to its very very severe form and it's feline infectious peritonitis virus, and then uh, there's there's no chance that the cat will survive once that develops. And because of this deadly, vari deadly variant, um, these cats are followed uh, and, uh, and vets are interested in, in it. And this is the uh, table I made based on the data that were published by Eddie. Um, and, um, and here you see in blue when there's a more than fourfold rise in antibody titers. So here you see certain antibody titer and then there's a fourfold rise in 1989, which means that there's an infection and then here is another fourfold rise, indicating that uh, a year later there's another um, infection. And uh, then it lowers again, and here another rise, indi indicative that there's another infection. Um, so this shows that there are reinfections occurring. So here, here, here reinfections start occurring and we can determine what the, the interval is between infections. These, these cats were all one household. So the virus was continuously present in this uh, in in household, in these 26 cats. And, uh, and you see when, uh, when they lost uh, their immunity and got a re reinfection. First one occurred here. Here's a fourfold rise and then another fourfold rise indicating that only six months protection, here was another infection, some 11 months and 30, 24, 70, 100 months. So I think it's quite comparable with what we saw in the natural situation of the, uh, uh, in, in humans. So reinfection occur frequently. It's a general coronavirus thing. They occur frequently and um, frequently one year post-infection and sometimes shorter. Well, uh, it would be nice if this would be very informative, of course, for SARS-CoV-2. Um, I wrote this commentary for MED. I wrote it in November, was published in December, and uh, and and telling, showing to a lot of people, well, this is what we know. Uh, this might be informative for SARS-CoV-2, but now there are already two beautiful, really magnificent papers. Uh, one in New England Journal of Medicine showing the uh, the amount of protection you have when you are infected in the first wave and the protection you have in the second wave in the UK. And this is another beautiful paper. Uh, what's the protection when you've had the infection first wave in Denmark? Among, uh, that's 4 million people that were followed. Uh, and then looking again in the second wave, how many of those 4 million got infected um, and they had been infected before or, uh, or not. Beautiful paper showing that reinfections occur with SARS-CoV-2, that they occur less when you have been infected uh, or, or uh, that, they, uh, that infections occur less when you have had a previous infection. So there is protection, but it's not 100% because there are reinfections. These are uh, the collaborators um, um, uh, on this. The collab th these are the collaborations of this Nature Medicine paper on the, uh, the natural reinfections with seasonal coronaviruses. These are the people from my group. I'm grateful for all the ELISAs and all the things, virus discovery and things they have done. These are PhD former PhD students uh, of my group, and I thank them a lot for all their work on NL63. And uh, here only mentioned the collaborators for the Nature Medicine paper. And next slide is the 
uh, financing um, uh, um, apart the, 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 the grants that made uh, all the research possible. Thank you. Thanks very much. That was that was fascinating. Uh, so if, if uh, people have um, questions, you can either raise your hand and then uh, Marie can uh, unmute you and let you uh, ask the question, uh, or uh, you can type them into the um, into the Q and A, and they can be asked in the Q and A. Um, uh, and um, those of you in the UK will remember that um, earlier this year there was a triumphant. Uh, uh, stories in the newspapers, it was the front page of The Guardian saying that uh, um, the, the UK was going to lead the world in having the first ever uh, coronavirus challenge studies. And what they meant was they were going to do SARS-CoV-2 uh, challenge studies in, in, in volunteers. And really? I spoke, I, yeah. yeah, yeah. And I, I spoke to Kay Callow, who's a, a sprightly 93-year-old, and she was very surprised that they were, they were saying that 50 odd years on, they were saying that these were going to be the first ever uh, coronavirus <laughs> challenge studies. And uh, um, so uh, uh, it was lovely to, it was great to, to see you uh, talk about those, uh, those, those really important studies. And mm -hmm. um, there's a couple of questions uh, in the, oh, no, it just says great talk. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I, I'll ask a, a, yeah. a Couple of questions. Well, uh, I say others. If you raise your hands or put them in the put the put questions in the Q and A. Um, in 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 your your study when you were uh, following up from birth, you sort of you were saying there were some infections. You know, two months, three months. Um, uh, would would people not would ba the babies not still tend to have maternal antibodies at that uh, uh, at that age? Yeah, they 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 did. Um, so all the, all the babies were born with the maternal antibodies, um, but still, then the next uh, so the, so we had um, uh, serum from uh, from birth, um, at day of birth, uh, but then we then took the serum sample from two months later. We saw that there was al already a 1.4 rise in uh, in Eliza signal, and we know that a 1.4 rise is, is uh, actually it was it was even larger um, is is the rise you get when you have an infection. So there was it was not the antibody still from the mother, because we we had we knew exactly what the the levels were, uh, because we had the day zero serum sample. Okay. The, these are uh, serum. These are children that are followed because the mothers are HIV positives, uh, and then the children are followed uh, to see if they do not um, get infected, uh, zero convert for HIV. And this set was HIV negative children. That's okay. why we had the uh, samples. Right. Uh, and there's a, a um, Q and A from uh, from Caroline in the. Uh, and as uh, you, you talked about the sort of reinfection in this in your, na uh, your nature medicine paper up to sort of people aged twenties and older, <coughs> are, are there sort of separate data about reinfection in in children? No. About no. No, there is not any. So this one study that we did uh, in these volunteers. Um, is is the is actually the first uh, with doing the serology for all four viruses. It's it's not the first. Um, I'm immediately, I'm correcting myself. It's not the first that's done. Uh, there are a lot of these kind of uh, studies. Of course, I did not invent this. This was done already for a lot of the for two to nine E and OC forty three in the nineteen seventies and eighties. And then there they looked at um, uh, indeed in antibodies going up because also at that time they wanted to know how often these infections occur. But the pity is at that time they did not know that there was another alpha virus. So when they looked at, at antibodies going up to 229E, it could have been because of an infection by NL63. So all the reinfection data and uh, of, of, uh, of these old study, they are difficult to, or, or actually cannot be used anymore. So it can be that there were children among these studies, but they cannot be translated because there is another beta virus, it turned out, and there's another alpha virus, it turned out. Okay. So any, do you know of any studies going on in children that are, will be able to... Just no, I, I'm I'm not aware that children uh, that there are children studies going on. I I must say that I'm I'm I I would think it's strange if it would not occur, 
uh, but uh, but but still it it needs to be shown but because we saw in children that after an infection these antibody levels are not stable they decline very very fast uh, you, you saw it already in the picture i showed you saw already that they were going down a bit um, so um, so they don't they don't tend to be very long lasting so probably you need to be infected several times and then then you're more stable in your in your antibodies uh, but uh, yeah, I would love to see such a study, but I, I'm not planning it. And um, okay. a lot of people don't have these kind of cohorts in their freezer. Um, yeah. A couple of questions in the Q&A. Uh, when it comes to reinfection, if any, what difference would you expect between people previously infected with natural infection and people who had been vaccinated? Well, I can put it a wish. I, I wish it's the same uh, as uh, vaccinated, that it's the same as, as being infected. Uh, um, and that's, of course, the vaccine producer uh, have the same wish uh, because this, this, uh, this pa paper in PNAS and, uh, and also, uh, not PNAS, in, in uh, um, New England Journal of Medicine and uh, in The Lancet, they show that these reinfections uh, occur with less symptoms. So that's, uh, well, no, the New England Journal of Medicine paper show that it's with less symptoms. The Lancet paper cannot tell. Um, they did not score symptoms, um, but uh, it, it would be really nice if it was uh, with, with less symptoms. The, the fact that uh, what's, it was in, in the Netherlands on the news today that the vaccine is, uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine is actually better than expected and even 100% with protection from disease. Um, may even look as, as if the vaccine is even better than an infection. Because can you can you have can you have better than one hundred percent? No, you can't. So uh, so yeah. So, so far, the symptoms, uh, the, the the signs are uh, signs are good that the vaccine is really very good in protecting from disease. So that was in the news reports of the 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 US uh, AZ AstraZeneca trial, was it? Yeah, okay. yeah, it was. Yeah. So one hundred percent protection against severe disease. So that's, yes, indeed. That's yeah. It, which is really impressive. So if someone had got his first jab a week ago, that's, um, that's really good news. So, uh, um, the, uh, some more questions in the Q&A. Um, thanks for a very clear presentation. What's the take home message for a patient who has had COVID-19 infection a year back? Is it that now is the time they are likely to get reinfected? Does that mean that masks will need to remain a part of life for at least another few years? Oh, no. <laughs> oh no, mask uh, and masks for years. No, no, no. With mask, I only count in months um, because, well, uh, un unless you're an uh, anti-vaxxer, but um, uh, vaccination uh, is very good. Even when you've had an infection, get yourself vaccinated because indeed a natural infection does not pro provide long-term uh, protection. And whether a vaccine will provide long-term protection is also not known, but for sure it will do so for um, uh, six months, uh, perhaps, uh, perhaps it's uh, the same length. Um, but then you can get vaccinated every year, no problem, like influenza, uh, which because I would do everything, anything, uh, for sure go for vaccination every year to not be for lifelong with ma masks or not being able to, uh, uh, yeah, to, to stand close to, to uh, uh, somebody. Um, so I'm, I'm very strong pro vaccination and, uh, and that's the only way we can get. Um, uh, so, so the person who has had um, SARS-CoV-2 in, in uh, a year ago, get yourself vaccinated. Then you have another boost, which means that you're protected for another year um, and uh, it, uh, And then uh, another question, uh, from, uh, in the reinfection studies uh, where four different human coronaviruses were tracked, did you look into if there was any protection in the form of delayed infection from the other three coronaviruses and in infection with one of them? Good point. We did not look at it. No. We did not look. Um, it's very difficult, uh, but because we hardly saw protection 
um, by infection by by their by their own uh, coronaviruses. That was even six to twelve months. Um, but especially in the, in the beginning, we sampled every three months, and then we could could look whether if there was an infection by the other coronavirus, whether it does add up. Perhaps perhaps then it's double. We could look at it. I don't know if the numbers uh, are large enough, but we, we did not look at it. And then uh, another question. From what you've said, can we assume that the most probable outcome is to have COVID jabs every year? To, to have COVID? Uh, will, no. we be get, will, will we be getting vaccination, need to get vaccinated every year? I'm, I, um, I, th I think that's the most likely scenario. I think that that, that uh, vaccination, uh, perhaps it's it's way better than a natural infection could be, uh, but but let's not uh, uh, think we are more um, wealthy than we are. Well, that's a Dutch expression, but uh, I think I think we're happy if it's twelve if it's twelve months. Uh, yeah, I think it's every year. Uh, that that would be doable, and uh, I'm only afraid if it would would be two months, which is which is not the case, because then we would see already with vaccination, uh, everybody starting vaccination, and also the, the the clinical trials with vaccination. Then it then they would now already see that vaccination starts, uh, um, that immunity starts waning, and I have have heard no stories of that yet. And. Um, um from the sort of seasonal coronavirus studies, were any data have any data ever been collected on whether um, after a first infection that you are you're obviously infectious, uh, and whether uh, how infectious you are uh, is decreased by the fact that it's been a repeat infection? Um. The, uh, it's it's absolutely infectious because I think the study by. Um, a certain lead study by Kello, uh, the virus that was produced was, uh, if, if I remember right, but the virus was uh, cultured yeah. to show the virus. This this is pre-PCR time, time. Yeah. So finding the virus, showing that the virus is there and and secreted, uh, if that's positive, it means it was cultured. So this is definitely infectious virus being shed. Yeah, I guess I think the question. Was, is, would be whether these people might be less infectious than if it was the first, if it was the first infection. Not, not, that you, not that it's a sort of all or none that you're just not producing. Because, I mean, they've shown with, you know, some people have, have been vaccinated and with SARS-CoV-2 and had a reinfection and you can culture, you can, you know, you can develop yeah. virus. I suppose the hope is that they might be less infectious. They might be a lower viral load from those people if they're transmitting. But yeah, it, it it would be nice. It would be nice. nice yeah. <laughs> but I think I think there's not even that correlation uh, now with being asymptomatic and being symptomatic. I don't think there's. Uh, I think they both uh, shed the same kind of same amounts of infectious uh, particles. Um, and as after vaccination or after first infection, your symptoms are less. I, but I think the virus can 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 remain the same um, in this, the same amounts. Brilliant. So, uh, any I can't see any open questions. If anyone's got a uh, last uh, a last question, um, so that's that's a, a, a really fascinating um, talk. So, thanks very thanks very much for that. It's well, you're unlike, unlike the problem with online seminars is we can't really applaud. So, but, but <laughs> you can imagine you have to you have to imagine this club. So, uh, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, thanks. Thanks so much for the uh, for the seminar. Okay. Thank you. thank you very much for inviting me, and uh, have a nice day. Right. Thank we'll you. Go on to the other link now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Bye. 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 Bye.